to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. So this is joint work with my former student Anup Bishwas, who is now in Aisar Pune. It's actually quite old work, and it's already published in 2009. So why am I talking about this? The simple reason is that uh, I felt that was the closest fit to the theme of the event, which is large deviations. It's not that I have stopped working after 2009, but <laughs> it's not, not been in large deviations. With one exception, there was a sequel you know, where similar techniques were used for some, for some other problem. I'm not going to talk about that for a different reason. I'll come to that towards the end of this talk. Okay, so I have made this, uh, I, I realized that the background of probably all the audience is not uh, in control, which is what basically I'll draw upon. So I have made it kind of tutorial. So first I'll talk about the friedel dimensional theory, which uh, this builds upon, and then the main topic is small noise limit of diffusions, but in the stationary regime. So describe the problem, and then this is standard trick which has been exploited to the hilt by many people, called the logarithmic transformation. And then what I'll do is then the main result, which is the small noise limit. And different here is the control theoretic approach. And the uh, results of the flavor, namely small noise limit in the stationary regime, are already there in Friedel and Wenzel book. But they consider uh, diffusions on a compact manifold. There are some technical improvements there. Again, there's also other work uh, post Friedel and Wenzel and before our work, particularly by S.J. Hsu. And uh, again, so it, it has a similar, Hsu had essentially similar kind of results but under somewhat very extremely restrictive conditions. So the gain in using the control theory approach has been primarily to expand the scope in the sense that uh, give this kind of characterizations under somewhat broader conditions. Okay, so let me start with uh, small noise limits in general. That's the friedel wenzel framework. So you look at the stochastic differential equation uh, driven by a Brownian motions scaled by a small parameter epsilon. And I'll make the standard assumption that the drift M is Lipschitz, so that it's well posed. And what we want to see what it does as epsilon goes to zero. So for the timing, I'm essentially recalling what's known from Friedlin Wenzel, so I'm considering it on a finite time horizon. So what you expect is that as epsilon goes to zero, you should recover the ordinary differential equation without noise. And that, that indeed is the case. So this is not particularly surprising or hard to show that the, the probability major, the probability law of the diffusion will concentrate on the differential equation trajectory. But what large deviations does is to quantify how the concentration occurs. And it's very crudely put, it basically says that the probability of not being in a epsilon tube around the trajectory. If the trajectory, if you have considered a differentiable trajectory, which is not the ODE trajectory, then the probability of it goes down in this fashion. I'll make this more precise. What I'm saying is that this a large deviation principle holds with this, as, uh, this particular object called action as the rate functional. So this is a large deviation principle on a function space. We are looking at the, the law of the diffusion is the probability measure on space of continuous functions from 0t to rd. That's what I mean by c0t to rd. And it concentrates on a particular trajectory with uh, there's an associated large deviation pr principle with this as the rate. And um, in fact, since there are a lot of physicists here, the um, and Friedlin Wenzel in the introduction motivate this from uh, by citing the correspondence principle. So you, so one, you can go from uh, the Feynman integrals to Wiener integrals through the by complexifying time the Feynman cards device. And uh, and if you think of Planck's constant as not being a constant but some an epsilon going to zero, then you recover the classical mechanics in the small noise limit. So let me now talk about logarithmic transformation. 
So the, here the idea is very simple. So uh, 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 for, I'm now considering a pro probability distribution on say, some Euclidean space. So it's just a normalizing factor. Suppose it's of this form, e to the minus v by epsilon square. Then as epsilon goes to zero, it will concentrate on the minimizer of v, which is kind of obvious. So what we are doing essentially is the function space counterpart of uh, this kind of thinking. And uh, the key thing is that the, um, the idea is that you are uh, uh, reducing the concentration issue to a nonlinear minimization problem. So it's a nonlinear function v typically which you want to minimize. The corresponding thing in function space will be that it will be a control problem, not an optimization problem, but since it's a dynamical system, you reduce it to a control problem and therefore you get the expression, uh, characterization of the rate function as you know, what's called the value of the control problem. So I'll come to that later. So just a histor historical aside, the lock trans the, to my knowledge, the one of the early uses of uh, this kind of transformation was this Koloff transformation. Is, of course, there's more than lock transformation to this, but uh, the lock transform was a key component of uh, relating the viscous Burgers equation to heat equation. This should have been U. Okay, so for uh, now let's consider this T bigger than S and XT as a conditional density given by this. Actually, some diffusion with this as a density. I'm considering somewhat more general case here. And if you consider this functional, then that satisfies. Okay, in fact, it is. This is for the noise part of dynamics which I considered. So this object will satisfy this backward Kolmogorov equation. And in fact, this is the basically this is the backward Kolmogorov equation with the potential. This is this extra term, and this is precisely the Feynman cards representation for solution of this. Okay, so, so this is a linear parabolic equation, and because this is non-degenerate in the sense that I have a Laplacian with a positive coefficient, it's a nice parabolic equation. It will, it will have a classical solution and so on. Uh, satisfying appropriate growth conditions. Uh, I mean, you can prove uniqueness with appropriate growth conditions. In fact, given growth conditions, you can use Ito formula to show that the solution has to satisfy this as this representation, and that's one way of proving uniqueness. But X of T was your original. Yeah, yeah. SD yeah. yeah. Here I have uh, gone unnecessarily general. It will be <laughs> T minus S. Now I want to take, do this lock transformation. Just define. So the idea is okay. This is some some psi, which is some uh, a positive function. So I, I can think of it as e raised to minus something divided by epsilon square, and that something is what I have called phi. So if I do this substitution, I get this equation. This is just uh, calculus. But then I rearrange term. I just manipulate it to write it in this fashion. Okay, and this becomes uh, what's called the hamilton jacobi bellman equation associated with the stochastic control problem. And that's the connection between control and this. And then, so this I'm just giving a kind of preview. I'll re revisit each of these things after I introduce more jargon. So letting epsilon tend to zero, you get a, suppose you get a limit p hat, and turns out to be, so when I let epsilon go to zero, I'm killing the noise. So the limiting control problem will be a deterministic control problem. And contrary to what one might think, the deterministic control problems are harder. Because the Hamilton Jacobi equation is a first order, this is a second order term. So it doesn't, typically it doesn't have a smooth, so not even well posed many times. So it becomes much harder. So what you typically get is this is notion of viscosity solution of the Hamilton Jacobi equation for the deterministic control problem of minimizing this for this control system. So this, as I said, is generally ill post, typically has non-uniqueness issues, but this is one way of picking the selection principle, which gives you a unique choice, which in some sense is natural or physical choice. So this is a control system, so I'm thinking of this as, so U is some control you choose. So I have modified the original differential equation by having another external driving force. The problem is to choose u so as to minimize this. That's the control problem. Well, I'll, uh, 
So there's a dynamic programming equation for which uh, this will be the viscosity solution. I'm going to redo this in some detail again. This, this one? So this is basically, uh, I mean, uh, uh, this is the, essentially this quantity, the, uh, this has uh, this object. So if if I didn't have C, so it's a conditional expectation of some ter terminal, some function given at the end. Then this is just the backward Kolmogorov uh, equation. So you have this forward and backward equations. So forward is the Fokker Planck. This is the backward equation. There's this extra term because of the potential. So actually, this uh, if you do this uh, complex complexification of time in Schrodinger equation with the potential, this is the kind of thing you get. So this is the Feynman cards formula for the for the solution. So before I proceed, there, are, there have been multiple uses of this. So this is also analyzed to uh, use to, to analyze the nonlinear filtering equation. So this is the problem of estimating one uh, one Markov process giving, giving uh, having some noisy observations of a repeated process, and uh, the nonlinear filtering is actually a stochastic partial differential equation, which gives the evolution of the conditional distribution of the unobserved process, giving the observations. Again, it's a, it's a stochastic parabolic equation. And uh, what Fleming and Mitter did was to, again, apply log transformation to this stochastic solution of the stochastic partial differential equation and interpret it in terms of the, the, the of course, you get some Hamilton-Jacobi equation parameterized by a random process, and then they can interpret the filtering problem in terms of that. Another major application has been what's called risk sensitive control problem, which is basically you try to maximize or minimize the growth rate of this exponential functional. So look at this kind of uh, e raised to zero to p to some, so this is your control ds log one by t. So you consider exponentiated cost or reward, and then you seek to minimize or maximize, depending on whether the cost or reward, this kind of function, which is quite popular with the finance community because it comes in naturally. They look at geometric Brownian motion and compound interest. As they these things naturally lead to expansion. Exponentiation, that's one re reason. Another more important reason is that the classical control problems where you say minimize or maximize expectations of some functionals, as I did here, they are, they are sort of subject to criticism that when you minimize an average that doesn't tell you much about, for example, the variance could be very high. Okay, so it just tells you that expected value is minimized, but the other movements could be extremely bad. Whereas this, in some sense, uh, sort of, if you think of the Taylor series for exponential, it uh, puts some weight on other movements as well. So this is considered a more robust way of minimizing uh, uh, any particular cost. And uh, it, it has some technically interesting issues. It needs, leads to a nonlinear eigenvalue problem. The hamilton jacobi bellman equation of this is, is a very <coughs> specific features which make it kind of distinctive. Now, the control theoretic approach uh, to large deviations, of course, uses this. And this is, all, this is also not new. This, uh, these two books, in fact, not papers, they deal with it extensively. Dupuy Ellis are mostly in discrete time framework, the somewhat older book. And this is more recent, where they look at continuous time problems. The difference with what we're doing is we're looking at the stationary regime. That's actually, otherwise, uh, in the finite time problems, et cetera, these things are, have already been around. So let me give a short course on control diffusions. So here, the idea is that you now have introduced this control process. And um, suppose I want to minimize this cost. Okay. So what I have is the some, some running cost plus I penalize high values of, uh, this is typically some energy or something. You don't want to, uh, uh, you don't typically have the freedom of using arbitrarily large controls because that can trivialize the problem for one thing and it's not realistic either. And because this is a stochastic problem, this is additional constraint of non-anticipativity in the sense that the control should not, anyway, this is a formal statement, the intuition is that the control should not anticipate future increments of Brownian motion, the driving Brownian motion. So it can 
use all the past information and use some extraneous randomization, but not the future increments of programming motion. And given that this is this, uh, I have been using the word value function. The value function is basically the minimum cost to go from time t onwards. So if I, if I am at time t, I am at position x, then vx comma t is the minimum remaining cost from uh, t to capital T, plus, uh, so this is the running cost, plus this is the terminal cost, and the minimization is over all non-anticipative non controls. So the, I will give a formal derivation over the hamilton jacobi velman equation. So Vxt, I go just an incremental time delta into future, then I pay immediately this much, this is the running cost, so at, over the time t to t plus delta, I pay something like this. And from t plus delta onwards, I will pay this, because that's, this is the dynamic programming principle. The minimum at time t is at, uh, at some stage, and minimum over the immediate cost plus the minim, uh, minimum from next stage onwards. That's roughly, that's the discrete, that's the exact picture in discrete time, but we are in continuous time, so it's approximate. So I have just moved from t to t plus delta, this is what I pay immediately, and this is the minimum of what I would have to pay for from the from time t plus delta onwards. And this, the fact that this is kind of equal is essentially what's called dynamic programming principle. Now, this I can apply. Uh, I'm assuming that this is uh, twice continuously differentiable, let's say. Then you can apply Ito formula to this and get right, this as Vxt plus this term, where a script L sub u is the sort of controlled generator of the control diffusion. So this comes uh, directly from Ito formula. And this again, uh, further approximation, write it like this. So this integral I write it as just what's inside at x comma t times delta. Now we have Vxt on both sides. I can, and uh, that, uh, that doesn't affect the minimization, so I can cancel Vxt and get zero on the left hand side, then divide, divide the right hand side by delta and letting delta go to zero, you get this equation. That's the hamilton jacobi wellman equation. So it generalizes actually the hamilton jacobi equation of classical mechanics. So if you think of the Lagrangian formulation as a control problem of minimizing the action and apply dynamic programming, you'll get back the hamilton jacobi equation of classical mechanics. Now this equation is exactly what I had got earlier for phi. Okay, so my psi xt was e to the minus phi xt by epsilon square, and phi is precisely the value function of this control problem, so the minimum cost to go. So that's the interpretation of the rate function. So if I uh, start exhibiting the epsilon dependence explicitly, and let epsilon go to zero, then what you get in the limit, so this thing again I will revisit, what you get in the limit is the control problem of minimizing this, so there's no expectation now because the control problem, this becomes deterministic. So you want to minimize this finite horizon cost over this controlled ordinary differential equation. And the idea is that phi uh, zero is the unique viscosity solution for the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So I'll give a short tutorial on viscosity solutions now. So this is the general formulation, it's article equation is like this, and so this is the function, it's gradient and Hessian, uh, and uh, the condition on H is that uh, if X, uh, these are, uh, this last argument is a posit uh, symmetric matrix, and if X minus Y is positive definite, so X dominates Y in a certain sense, then this inequality should hold. And you see that the function phi is the viscosity solution of this equation, if for any X in the interior of a domain and a smooth phi so that the functions agree and the difference phi minus phi has a local maximum at x, then you should have this inequality. And so this actually defines what's called a sub-solution and is a symmetric statement if I replace maximum by minimum and reverse the inequality. That's called a super-solution. If both hold, then it's called a viscosity solution. And let me try to give some intuition for this. So see, I've taken, I've chosen a smooth phi such that phi equal to uh, uh, the, uh, the, the two functions agree at x, so replacing uh, uh, think of small phi here, so replacing this by this is uh, no big deal because I have set them equal, 
because it's uh, suppose assuming suppose both were smooth if this had a maximum at x then their gradients will also, also match so replacing this by this also it no big deal and if it's a local maximum then the difference between uh, the hessian of the difference will be negative definite and that's why you expect this to be replaced by this okay so it's a reasonable thing to so this is kind of more intuitive definition there's a, another equivalent definition in terms of sub differentials etc which uh, which is less intuitive so these are the useful facts the classical solution is always a viscosity solution then this is the important property that uh, typically limits of if you the way to one often approaches these power problems is take approximations of problems which are these solutions and then past will limit to get a solution of the limiting problem and the, what helps there is that limits of viscosity solutions are viscosity solutions and very often they are unique and that that's the motivation for doing this in the first place that gives a selection principle for ill posed problems with multiple solutions you can pick one solution as being natural so the intuition so I have, this is one particular case this is the way it appears in the stochastic control problem so uh, i have pulled pulled the second order term outside so the, uh, i mean typically there would be some uh, positive definite matrix it would typically be trace of some posit positive definite matrix time session but laplacian is a simple simple case so suppose this is your ajb equation this is what we have in the present case and the second order term comes in an additive form and then let epsilon go to zero and then you know, what you get is a unique viscosity solution for the limiting case which is first order and uh, i just want to mention that uh, uh, in this uh, famous paper on chaos and strange attractors of ekman and ruel they attribute uh, they mention a uh, 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 proposal by kolmogorov of, of handling any ill posed problem with non uniqueness as adding add noise let noise go to zero and get what uh, take the limit as a natural solution i, I don't know I and mean, they don't give a reference to which kolmogorov's work has it but it's a sleek idea and kind of lies behind this as well because as you saw that this is actually a small noise limit which gives a unique choice and in fact i think the name viscosity solution comes from the fact that if this were i mean if you think of navier stokes then the second order term the coefficient in front of the second order term is the viscosity there have been other successful applications of this particularly in evolutionary game theory where you look at actually the stationary regime and take the small noise limit and you get a selection principle for nash equilibria which usually are too many and uh, that's one major application and this also been application in some nonlinear circuits which show hysteretic kind of behavior but if you look at the dynamics then it is ill posed but then if you add noise and take the small noise limit you get the actual behavior of the circuit okay so let me get back to my problem so what we look at is this small noise limit these are smooth bounded with bounded derivatives etc and this is the important assumption that it's a non degenerate in the sense that uh, i assume that both uh, the smallest eigen value of a smallest and largest eigen value of a are bounded in the particularly the one the uh, bounded below by some positive small lambda so the noise kind of enters all components in an even fashion and let theta be the zero vector so without loss of uh, so i am going to consider a simple case i'll mention the more general case later simple case when the this dynamics has a unique asymptot globally asymptotically stable equilibrium and that's the without loss of generality take that to be the origin this is a technical condition which we took from some other work actually it's a stability condition but what the important thing it gives us is some regularity result which we use i'll come to that later define this as the extended generator so this is the epsilon equal to zero limit and one can is easy to is non degenerate so one uh, one can show that the stationary distribution has a density phi epsilon and also one can show that uh, as epsilon tends to zero it will concentrate on the dirac major at uh, at the origin which is not surprising it's not hard to show either 
the main result is this that uh, the rate function for this uh, this is the density the rate function is given by this object where the infimum is all measurable and locally square integrable huge such that uh, the resulting y so think of the control system y dot uh, yeah it's here so think of this control system so i have, i have reversed incidentally this is a big difference uh, between this and the finite time case i have reversed the sign here so you have to push this against its natural uh, natural inclinations of the original dynamics and um, eventually it has to go to theta so theta is a stable equilibrium so the uh, picture around theta will be if it's a sink so if this is the equilibrium it will look like this all trajectories but i am reversing the drift so it starts becomes a source and the control has to push it against those arrows so it will take some energy and basically this is roughly the energy minimum energy it will take to push it to theta so that's the characterization of this so this is the value function for this control problem so i'll sketch the proof so this is actually something a problem proof you know but anyway i have given a short proof so this is the transition semi group of markov process x then mu epsilon being invariant is characterized by this equation so it's easy to see the it's invariant so it's invariant under this semi group which is the restatement of that apply take f to the lef uh, left hand side and apply eto formula you get this and from that you conclude that this in integral of l epsilon on apply to any test function f and integrate with with this to mu should be zero which basically says that uh, l epsilon adjoint c epsilon is zero so this is the standard characterization of uh, invariant measures and here it becomes uh, actually explicitly evaluated uh, Uh, the adjoint you get all this you uh, the a let's define a epsilon as this and uh, w epsilon as this term which is what we want we want the epsilon going to zero limit of this then w epsilon satisfies this equation so there's this potential term which was not it's not there in l epsilon but it appears in l epsilon star the adjoint and uh, this becomes if you open up this equation it's basically a familiar hamilton jacobi bellman equation except that i mean it's for a different problem it's for what's called ergodic control problem so i want to control this diffusion with respect to this as the cost is a long long term average of something okay that's called ergodic control problem this this dynamic programming see i earlier for the finite horizon problem i derived dynamic dynamic programming giving some intuitive argument that you cannot do here because uh, this is a long run, run average so any finite interval doesn't matter okay gets wiped out so the way one has to do this is to consider discounted cost so cost weighted by uh, decreasing exponential e to the minus alpha t and then let alpha go to zero so write down the dynamic programming equation for the discounted cost norm kind of renormalize it appropriately and let alpha go to zero some non trivial effort involved but eventually you get the uh, uh, what's called a non linear poisson equation and that's this there's no time i mean so stationary situation there's no time derivative here this is uh, partial differential equations in space variables and so that's what you have now this uh, okay this is where that uh, exotic looking condition stability condition i had put It gives you this that this can be shown to be uniform the dipshits that helps us pass to the limit using the last call etc. And you get a Hamilton-Jacobi equation, first order Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the limit, and that can be shown to satisfy this where this is the control system as before. And the say here I have brushed a lot of details under a carpet. Essentially, you have to let t go, go to infinity here to justify that expression which I had and some. i mean the see the when you write down that l epsilon star is and uh, take the uh, apply log transformation it comes naturally actually this it um, i mean if you look at this friedland menzel you, you keep get this friedland menzel in fact to show that uh, 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 in epsilon going to zero if there are multiple equilibria uh, the, the process is like a markov chain between different equilibria or compact attractors 
and you have to worry essentially about the stable ones and uh, uh, the transition prob probability is basically e to the minus something and that something basically energy required to push from one to the other and uh, it's because you have reversed that you need energy otherwise it would go there on its own and this kind of uh, intuitive interpretation. So general statement is this, if you have more than uh, one equilibria, you have another minimization over the uh, stable equilibria actually. Okay, the uniqueness needs some more work, but uh, be again because of the Lipschitz condition one can manage this. So, I think I'm more or less almost done. So as I said, there was a sequel to this. So we use similar things for uh, kind of mean field limits in, in the stationary regime. So let me just describe the problem since there's a lot of time left. So actually you consider, let's say capital N con continuous time Markov chains. And what I do is uh, consider a rate function for of ith chain dependent on others. This is the average interaction of the others. Okay, so this will let me just uh, go back to something older, which is the differential stochastic differential equation analog. So suppose you consider. <coughs> this equation, so n interacting diffusions, and these are independent uh, Brownian motions. The interaction is averaged over n, uh, uh, the, uh, all the particles, and suppose the initial condition is also, uh, initial conditions are independent, IID say. If you go to the n going to infinity limit, you get something like this. This is, of course, uh, you can think of this average as a, uh, uh, you can think of this as expectation of m x i t dot over a random major, finitely supported random major. So you get a limiting major which satisfies the nonlinear parabolic equation called the mckeen vlasov equation. So, the, uh, so this was, of course, uh, and, uh, done long back by McKean and vlasov and analyzed by many people. That's a nice. Uh, kind of lecture notes by Schnirman on that. And then the counterpart for, for discrete change was analyzed by again several people like Carl Glam and others. What we, so we stands for me and Rajesh Sundaration. And uh, what we did was to look at this in the stationary regime using similar control theoretic ideas. And uh, the reason it is not included here is that the next talk will probably address this. Could you do the same thing with when you have two stable equilibrium? And um, do you have uh, some regularity results on the solution of the, Hamil the viscosity solution of the Hamilton Jacobi equation? Yeah, we have uh, done the general multiple equilibrium case. I, I didn't uh, talk about it, but I mean, I, I stated the result at the end. This is what you get, minimum over the stable equilibria. And can you prove that the W is continuous? Say. Yeah. We, we have that, uh, because of the strong condition in the beginning, we have this uh, uniform Lipschitz bound on, uh, Lipschitz condition on this. That's why we, we can pass to the limit. And this uniqueness is only, uh, you can add a scalar, uh, W plus constant will also be a solution. So uniqueness is modulo the additive scalar. So this, uh, oops. Yeah, this condition. This we took from a paper by Metafuni, Pallara and Randi. And they, they have uh, very strong estimates which we are able to use. <coughs> paper in general of functional analysis, I don't remember exactly when.